Good afternoon. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Dean Lane. I'm the Senior Vice President for um, Cyber Intelligence here at the Institute of World Politics. And today, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker. Um, her name is Sarah Vakshuri. There's so much to talk about her that I had to cut it down and put it into bullet points. So I'm going to go through some of them. Um, you should know she's the founder and the president of SBB Energy International. So founding a company is not a simple thing. Um, she's a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. She's internationally recognized as an expert and has extensive experience in global energy and market studies, energy security, and uh, geopolitical risk. Um, she focuses primarily on the Middle East, Iran, um, Mexico, um, Saudi Arabia, those, those, I know Mexico's not in the Middle East, but it's a focus for her. Um, and she works both in the public and the private sector, so her knowledge is not just of the industry, but of the verticals within the industry. Uh, Dr. Vakshuri has advised numerous energy and policy uh, leaders, international corporations, think tanks, investment banks, law firms, so you can kind of get an idea of, of the true expertise that she has. Um, she's testified to Congress. Um, on the uh, obviously on the energy markets um, she's authored a book and um, I've asked her to give me all our spare time but she has not okay so please help me welcome Dr. Vaksha thank you well I would like to thank I uh, Institute for World Politics for having me here today and for a very, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, oil, uh, crude oil, uh, petrochemical, uh, natural gas, LNG, and um, refined petroleum products. So we're going to stay here for the next week talking about all of that. But the whole idea is that how the energy security, when we are talking about energy security, everything is integrated uh, and how things could have uh, impact on each other. Uh, we are talking always about oil, crude oil, but uh, what type of crude oil? What is the different types of crude oil? How different types of crude oil's production uh, and uh, consumption, demand and supply is going to have an impact on uh, the refinery margins and how on the other side the demand for different refined petroleum pro uh, products is going to have impact on the uh, crude oil uh, market and uh, um, consumption and uh, uh, production. Uh, on the natural uh, gas, how uh, different crises like Qatar crisis could have impact on uh, LNG market and how we could increase the security of gas market. Uh, starting with crude oil, uh, it's very important to look at uh, how things are happening today in the market. The OPEC uh, and non-OPEC production cut of about uh, reached to about uh, 1.2 million barrels per day. Uh, on the other side, we have a demand growth of 1.5 million barrels per day. If we have Saudi Arabia to cut further 400 to 600 thousand barrels per day, we could expect the crude oil prices to remain uh, above $50 per barrel by the end of this year and first quarter of next year. Uh, the reason that we mentioned Saudi Arabia because currently is the only country uh, within the OPEC that still has uh, further extra capacity in compared to its 2014's production that could be reduced if the kingdom decides. Uh, the OPEC production uh, cut made a very interesting impact on the market and that uh, was changing the balance of pricing prices between the heavy and light crude oil. So traditionally, the heavy crude oil, because it yields, in the, when you process the crude oil in the refinery, it yields more middle and heavy distillate, it, had, 
it was priced lower than light crude oil. That by nature, when you put it in the refinery, it produces more light distillate uh, uh, refinery products like gasoline or uh, uh, like fuel, uh, uh, jet fuel or uh, gasoline. But because the crude oil uh, production of most of the uh, OPEC countries uh, uh, is a heavy crude oil, when they reduce their supply uh, and cut their production, the supply of heavy crude oil reduced. So for the interesting, for the first time, we have the light crude oil, WTI, uh, are, the prices are less and below the heavy crude oil, the Dubai crude oil. And what was the consequences of this price change, the uh, quality, uh, the price uh, change of heavy versus uh, light crude oil on the refineries? We have uh, countries like India, uh, Reliance uh, Refinery, that are very high tech, uh, technology uh, tech, uh, refineries. And traditionally, they used to buy cheaper heavy crude oil from Iran, processing it and uh, producing more light distillate uh, products that are uh, sold in way higher prices. So they would create a huge margin of profit. But now that the crude oil, heavy crude oil prices are higher than light uh, prices, the refiners are, are not making enough of a, a margin that they could make. So we see that how uh, uh, OPEC production cut could have an impact on refinery margin. And it's very important that when we are talking about the oversupply in a market or production cut, what type of production is added to the market or cut back. Most of the production increase have been from U.S. shale uh, oil production, which is the, uh, which is the light uh, crude oil. On the inventories, uh, usually the price of crude oil uh, was determined by uh, the uh, market fundamental, supply and demand. But now the market is solely focusing on the inventories and they are constantly checking the average of inventories to its five years uh, five years average. So in order to having the prices to go above uh, and stay above $50, we need the inventory price, uh, the inventory volumes to be lower than its five-year average. And for a long term, I mean, me, short in a short term, but a long term maintenance of prices above $50, we still need additional cut of 400 to 700 bar uh, thousand barrels per day. And something that is very interesting, we have a oil stock market or a paper market versus the physical market. And the interesting thing about the paper market is that the volumes of trade in a paper market is way higher than the actual physical market. So any psychologic impact on the paper market is going to be exaggerated. Uh, uh, it is, it, its impact is going to be is exaggerated on the actual uh, prices. The reason for that is that every day we have 1.2 uh, billion barrels of crude oil uh, 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 traded in the physical market versus uh, 50 million barrels per day of actual physical crude oil. So uh, the paper market is very, very sensitive to the level of inventories and that could have a very serious impact on uh, the, uh, the prices. Supply and demand, uh, we have for first quarter of 2018 and for, uh, uh, from first quarter of 2018 to first quarter of 2019, we are going to have further additional uh, oil production supply coming mostly from U.S., Kazakhstan, from Kashagan field, Nigeria, and Libya. On the demand side, demand is also uh, uh, growing strongly. Why? because of gasoline. The interesting thing is that when the price of oil is low, the demand for gasoline increases. Uh, and the increase for the, because people drive more. The prices of gasoline is cheap, people drive more, uh, they consume more gasoline. So higher gasoline demand is going to increase uh, the uh, uh, energy demand, uh, demand for oil, beside from the uh, uh, actual uh, demand growth, uh, annual demand growth, uh, uh, which is determined by the economic growth and population of course. The investment, uh, how investment is going to uh, impact on production is also very interesting questions. There are uh, people that are arguing that the investment level on the uh, upstream side have been uh, reduced in the past few years because of low oil prices and that is going to have an impact on the amount of production 
and supply. So we are going to have the market is going to balance itself because the investment level were low. But again, it's very important to look at the price range because if you're looking at an oil price range of 30 to 40 dollars, we're going to have different uh, amount of investment. If you're having looking at the prices of 40 to 50 and above 50 dollars uh, per barrel, so they're all going to have. Uh, significant differences uh, on uh, how much the production is going to grow uh, and uh, of course the supplies. The demand growth, the largest growth is going to be in Asia uh, and China mostly and after that India again going back to the gasoline demand and after that we have Middle East countries but what is interesting about Middle East countries and somehow about Asia is that their demand growth is less than uh, the speed of their growth in, back in 2014. The reason for that was that the countries used these low oil prices to reduce the subsidies. So we don't see that huge demand growth as uh, the, the, the rate of growth as we were seeing in the past uh, previous years. Uh, as I mentioned, China is going to account for the largest demand growth, partially because its demand is growing on the other side because uh, its production is going to have a natural production drop and uh, its oil production is going to have a, a drop due, uh, due to the natural decline. Uh, when we are looking at supply, it's also important to take into account uh, uh, the natural production decline of countries, let's say like Russia, and how much the investment is going to offset these uh, natural production decline. Line. The role of technologies, of course, uh, is playing a major role in how supply is going to change uh, in the near future. In the refined petroleum products, the story is slightly different. The, when we are talking about the um, prices of crude oil, the cr uh, crude oil prices are determined by the market. Uh, but when it comes to refined petroleum products, uh, product, the impacting factors and influencing factors is economic growth and oil prices. So the more economic growth, people are going to use more energy, more uh, more fuel, uh, either if it's in their uh, power plants or uh, driving more or in their industries, uh, in uh, engine of their uh, industry. So economic growth uh, has a very important impact on how prices are uh, set in the uh, refined petroleum products uh, market. Uh, I mentioned a bit er earlier about that how crude type uh, influences the refinery margins and how the changes of the price gap between light and crude oil prices that now happen due to the OPEC production cut has changed the margin of the profit for the uh, refinery uh, producers. Security of flow for refined petroleum products is very much uh, depends on location and availability. For instance, we had the recent um, uh, storm in uh, Houston or uh, other places in uh, Florida. So we have uh, how fast uh, the flow of uh, refined petroleum products could divert and change from one place to the other place is going to have an important impact on the security of that. And Coming to regulations, one important regulation that at least we have in the U.S. is the Jones Act that is having an important impact on how the refined petroleum products are moving and the flow of that from East Coast to West Coast and vice versa. One interesting regulation that is going to have an interesting and important impact on the refined petroleum products market is the regulation set by International Maritime Organization, which requires uh, the, uh, mm, the uh, tankers and all the vessels to reduce the amount of fuel oil mix that is used in their bunkering, which means that by 2020, which is coming, it's uh, around the corner, all of these uh, tanker companies uh, have and tankers have to reduce the amount of fuel oil that they're using in their bunkers. What is the consequences of that for that? There are countries, um, oil producing countries like Iran, that is the um, one of the major exporter and producer of OPEC, but the refinery system is very basic in this country. So naturally when they process their heavy crude oil, the refinery yield is more heavy uh, fuel, like fuel oil. And if we are going to have a significant drop of fuel oil demand because of IMO organization, then some of the countries or some of the refiners that 
they are having a very basic uh, mm, uh, technology and they're producing significant amount of fuel oil are going to have facing problems marketing and selling their fuel oils. Going back to Iran as a case study, uh, Iran um, is uh, developing a huge uh, refinery uh, for pr processing its condensate, Persian Gulf refinery to process uh, Iran's condensate and produce more light distillate uh, like gasoline. But now that Iran is the start facing the threat or the, uh, the challenge of uh, marketing and selling of these huge volumes of fuel oil come, uh, produced by the refinery of this country, they start thinking to mixing their condensate with their crude oil and that's, that way they produce less fuel oil. And again, going back to that huge investment in the refineries for processing condensate, they might not have enough of uh, feedstock uh, to uh, complete uh, the maximum capacity of that refinery because of these uh, uh, fuel mates. The low oil prices, uh, among other uh, refined petroleum products, has a significant and immediate impact on gasoline uh, production, uh, gasoline consumption. So the current low oil prices had kind of boom the uh, demand for gasoline. And um, what that means, again, for refiners like uh, or crude oils that are producing more light distillates like U.S. shale oil, that could be a good news. For U.S. refineries, that could be a good news because they are in high demand. But again, for those refineries that are pretty basic, uh, this is not a good news. Uh, the other thing is that the major playing in the oil market, again, there are major oil producers, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, U.S., of course. But when it comes to... Petro uh, refined petroleum products, the major players are India, China, Korea, and US, of course, because the type and quality of the refineries that they have uh, and they can produce uh, uh, much more light distillate uh, crude oil from uh, heavy, uh, uh, light distillates from heavy crude oil that they are processing in their refinery. Going, uh, moving to LNG market, um, the difference between oil and LNG market and generally oil and gas market is the duration of commitment between the supplier and producer. So for crude oil, um, the most of, of the volume of crude oil could be sold as a spot or maximum one year, six months, one year or two years contract. But for natural gas, because of the nature of gas transportation, either if it's pipeline or liquid natural gas LNG, the commitment time, the duration of the commitment between the supplier and producer is way longer. Goes traditionally from 20 to 25 years. So the flexibility of LNG market is much less than flexibility of crude oil uh, market. And that causes different perspectives for security. Uh, going back to an example of Fukushima crisis that suddenly Japan uh, nuclear power plant was shut down uh, some of its capacity and they needed for increasing if they needed their demand for natural gas increased how could the LNG provider increase the production uh, increase the supply to Japan having 20 years contract to supply to another country. And we don't have a swing producer like Saudi Arabia in the natural gas market that they could easily increase the production uh, and feed the areas that need uh, mm, the, uh, the supply. So what happened, luckily, or as a coincidence, during the Fukushima uh, disaster, we had flexibility of demand in EU region. So at that time that the Fukushima crisis happened in Japan and Japan demand for natural gas and LNG increased rapidly, we had on the other side EU countries that because of economic recession and also the role, increased role of, of renewable energy, the demand for natural gas and LNG was reducing. Yet they were stuck with their 20 years contracts. So the flexibility of demand in EU region helped the suppliers like Qatar, that they had a very good marketing relation uh, with both J Japanese and European countries to redirect some of this capacity from EU region to Japan.
So when we are talking about the security of LNG market, the flexibility of the contract is very important. Well, of course, market nowadays is much more flexible. We even have LNG sold in the spot market, but the more flexible terms of contracts is of course increasing the security of the gas market. At the current moment, everybody puts a lot of attention on the oil oversupply. But we also have a serious LNG oversupply and production capacity, which is higher than the trade volumes currently. U.S. producers are constantly in investing, and the production that is coming out from U.S. LNG is mostly sold to middlemen. Going back to that long-term commitment that we were uh, talking, this means that most of this LNG in U.S. that is going to produce soon and come, uh, uh, come online is not sold with, it, with a 20 years purchase contract to the final users, but it's sold to the middlemen that are hoping to find a customer. So how much of these volumes are going to be lifted or not? That's a big question. The other thing at the current market that is a challenge for US LNG producer is the price, the LNG prices. So unlike the crude oil prices that we have benchmarks and kind of uh, uh, set globally, the LNG prices are very much regional based. And the LNG prices in both Asia and also Europe are way lower than the prices that US LNG producers could offer to these uh, consumers in, uh, in Middle East, in Asia, and in Europe. The reason for that is, especially in Asia and in um, uh, Middle East, the price of LNG is oil indexed. And now that the price of oil is very low, the price of gas, of course, is low in US, but you add the transportation cost from US, from US to Asia, Asian market, or to Europe, or Middle East, and also the taxes that is going to be added to the final prices the U.S. prices cannot compete with both uh, the term contract and also spot prices in Asia and Europe. Looking into European market, there is a bigger risk for U.S. even, and that's Russia. Russia, uh, Russian gas prices are very competitive with U.S. And the moment that U.S. LNG start going in a high volumes to Europe, there's always a danger that Europe, uh, Russia would reduce the prices and uh, again, going back to that long-term contracts, having that long-term contracts would help the producers to make sure that they're going to have a long-term secure demand. The market, we are expecting that the market is going to balance it, itself by 2020 to 2024 on the LNG side. And the reason for that is that beside most of the LNG investment in US and um, Australia, and some uh, Qatar, we're not going to have further investment to have a huge capacity to come online. But where is the most of demand coming for LNG? Japan, because most of the long-term uh, LNG contracts for Japan are coming to an end, mostly with Qatar, and by, 20, 20, by 2019, up to 2025, most of these contract terms are going to be expired and Japanese capacity for importing further LNG is going to be open. So if it's, uh, Japan is going to purchase LNG from US or Qatar or new investment in other countries, that's a big question. But of course, that's a, a large capacity that LNG producers and providers are looking into. And then, of course, we have the Qatar crisis. Um, um, the Qatar crisis, uh, I provided some um, visual uh, uh, guide, uh, guidelines, uh, which I think you have the print them, uh, printouts, uh, the handouts, looks more in details of Qatar crisis. Um, the Qatar crisis didn't have any actual and physical uh, impact on the LNG market. Uh, the ships and uh, LNG tankers still are passing through Suez Canal. They are still uh, able to load in Ras Laf uh, And even the Dolphin pipeline that is uh, uh, exporting or uh, transferring the Qatari gas to UAE did not have any interruption. So it didn't have any uh, impact on the 
serious impact on the prices. The duration of LNG transportation did not change a lot. There has been some ships that they had to reroute and change their direction of shipments, but didn't add a significant time change for delivery. Um, Qatari's, uh, Qatari government kind of proved that they are not using their gas as a political weapon or a tool of diplomacy against, let's say, UAE. So they never announced that they are not going to export to change the prices. Of course, they would need a secure demand, so they wouldn't uh, shot themselves in the feet. But they rather proved that they are a reliable source of supply and they are not going to let the politics to impact their supply. The other interesting thing is that about 12% of Qatar's uh, LNG supplies goes to Middle East. And again, we didn't see any supply interruption to those Middle Eastern importers. Uh, looking into Qatar, uh, to Egypt, um, that uh, for a short period of time, they were announcing that they don't, they might not accept in the Qatari origin LNG. Again, we didn't see any significant interruption. The reason for that was that Qatari LNG was uh, sold and transferred to Egypt uh, through uh, traders like Vito, which they could either change the origination of the LNG from their different cargoes or just simply uh, L uh, Egyptian wouldn't deal with Qatari. Looking into US oil and natural gas, uh, of course, um, um, on the boat side, US uh, is playing an important role, both on demand side and supply. 80% uh, of U.S. production by first quarter of 2018 is hedged at the price of 50 to 55 dollars per barrel. So, by first quarter of 2018, we still have time to maintain or increase the prices to 50 dollars and still see a uh, production increase from uh, U.S. Uh, oil fields. The shale production is going to be different if you look at the price range of. 30, 40, or $50. So it's very important to look at how much the prices are going to be. We are expecting that the OPEC countries are going to still continue their agreement to maintain the production cut. And we are still thinking that Saudi Arabia is very key into uh, managing the market. So if there is any crisis and the prices are dropping below a, a certain level, thank you. We are expecting that Saudis would help uh, managing the market which means reducing further production. Uh, I already uh, spoke about that, how uh, price cut changed the price differentials and how it impacted on the margin of the refinery. But it's very important to, uh, to put an emphasis on U.S. refined petroleum products. Um, the U.S. crude oil production has been always focused a lot uh, as how it's going to change uh, the market, how significant it is, and how uh, how much of a big role it has. But the U.S. refined petroleum products has a much more uh, important impact in the market. One reason is for gasoline. U.S. is going to be a major source of gasoline uh, supplier, especially to Asian countries like China. And that is going to uh, have an interesting impact on U.S.-China relation because most of U.S. oil and refined petroleum products is going to go to China uh, in the near future and long term uh, even. On the natural gas and LNG, I discussed that how U.S. Uh, LNG prices cannot compete uh, at the current level, at the current uh, oil prices with the uh, Asian uh, prices, both the term and spot market. Uh, the Gazprom uh, presence in the EU and how that could be a price risk for U.S. Uh, about the huge under construction capacity of LNG in U.S. and how most of these upcoming uh, capacities sold to middlemen rather than to the uh, final end users. The flexibility of the contracts, which we are expecting that starts from U.S. and the Qatar crisis is going to have an impact in the customer mind to push for more flexible terms. And again, Japan would be an important player in that to push for further flexible contracts is going to have a very important role on the security of gas flow. And also, if US producers could play a short-term swing production producer role in the market, that is going to also add uh, a positive uh, uh, element to the security of gas market. 
looking into US LNG supply that going back to that uh, IMO International Maritime Organization's um, um, regulation for reducing the amount of fuel uh, in the bunkering US LNG could be used as a good mix for uh, reducing the share of uh, fuel oil in the bunkering but at the current time we cannot expect because there's not enough uh, fueling facilities so we cannot see that within the next two years ships could stop and uh, use um, LNG to mix it with their fuel but going ahead by 2025 2020 2030 we could expect that US LNG become a major source for uh, bunkering and also US LPG uh, is going to grow uh, significantly and it's not profitable yet at the current low oil prices but if the prices increase it's going to be more profitable um, this slide is just uh, focusing on US energy policy under Trump era that how President Trump uh, is focusing on increasing the domestic oil, gas, and coal production in U.S. Um, you have uh, the printout. It also on the right side of the map shows on how most of the oil, coal, coal and natural gas uh, resources are located in the uh, states that are predominantly mostly Republican. So we're expecting that under President Trump, with his support uh, for domestic production and reducing the regulation, the domestic production to increase further. I'm not going to say that it's going to increase because of the impact of President Trump's policy, but we are talking a lot with most of the investors on the ground and they are happy with uh, less regulations. And not that these less regulations are going to have a um, technical impact for their production, but to increase the efficiency and uh, help them to save uh, time, as they say. Um, so I think that is going to be an interesting few years to look how it's going to have an impact on domestic production. Saudi Arabia role in the market. I told everybody we're here for the next week because covering energy security is not easy. There's a lot of topics to talk. Um, Nowadays, energy, uh, Saudi Arabia is a very interesting topic and many people are looking into Saudi Arabia one side from its production. Saudi Arabia current production after the OPEC cut still is about 400 to 500,000 barrels per day higher than their production in November 2014, which OPEC uh, members uh, decided to change their uh, uh, route and just um, produce and increase their market share. So Saudi Arabia, compared to other OPEC members, still has a huge uh, production uh, uh, range that uh, uh, could possibly, if market needs, uh, be reduced. And what we think, going back also to Saudi officials' statement, they are focusing on market share, which was uh, Ali and Naimi, the previous oil minister's policy. But the new oil minister, uh, 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 Al-Fala, he not only is focusing in his statements and in his uh, policy on market share, increasing US, Saudi Arabia's oil market share, but also on market management. So we are positive that if at the time of crisis, if the prices are really dropping below um, a range that market doesn't feel really comfortable with, that Saudis could or would cut further. But we think that Saudis would like to still maintain their role of uh, swing producer and they want to maintain the 2 million barrels per day of uh, swing capacity. Uh, per, uh, capacity. There is uh, the other interesting change that happened in Saudi policy is that their oil force security policy, which was started with King Abdul Aziz and how they make this oil for security pact with the US, is changing to oil for investment. Um, policy and the reason for that is that uh, now US uh, is a major producer of oil and natural gas uh, on the oil side uh, still Saudi Arabia has a huge market share uh, in US refineries Port Arthur also there is a different type uh, quality you Saudi oil is heavy US oil is light but in general US dependency on Saudi oil is not as it was 
many decades ago. So the new leadership in Saudi Arabia are looking into shifting from oil for security to investment for security, how they can engage investors in order to increase their deterrence and security. And IPOing uh, Saudi Aramco is part of that uh, long-term vision and goal. Um, going back to IPO, um, many people are discussing that Saudi government is waiting for the prices to increase and then IPO which of course is important and is going to have impact on the stock uh, shares but something that now they're challenging uh, Saudis is that the amount the very little amount that they're going to put in an IPO 5% and the amount of transparency on their reserves creates problem for them to being able to uh, uh, to um, offer their uh, IPO in large uh, stock uh, markets like in New York or in London. So we think that Asian uh, stock markets uh, would be a good uh, uh, candidate for Saudi uh, IPO. On the other side, China. China could just purchase them without going to any stock exchange and China is the largest uh, importer of Saudi oil. So um, there are final emergency uh, solutions for IPO but um, big challenge for IPO at the current moment is that they are not ma uh, meeting the uh, regulations for large uh, stock exchange market in the world, uh, mostly in Europe and US, London, UK and London, uh, US. Um, so this is just a summary of um, the talk, uh, the, the presentation today that how uh, the, on the crude oil market and the production um, a production cut in OPEC changed the prices of crude oil light versus uh, heavy, how that impacted on the refinery margins, how the level of in uh, inventories is important and impacting the prices and how it's going to impact the paper market, uh, how the supply and demand is going to change and um, looking into LNG dynamics, just uh, something not to forget the whole presentation uh, if you get a chance to look at it uh, later. and. The last two slides are the ones on uh, LNG, that how the LNG market is changing. Uh, you're seeing the two um, pie charts. Um, the first one shows the top exporter, the top, top LNG exporters uh, at the current moment, Qatar, Australia, and Malaysia in 2016. But by 2024, US is going to be the, uh, the, the US uh, export capacity is going to uh, be the second uh, exporter of uh, LNG and um, the uh, Qatar crisis that we cover that really since 1997 that Qatar started uh, exporting LNG there hasn't been any interruption due to political reasons uh, as of now didn't have any major impact on the prices or supplies of LNG but it has an interest is going to have an interesting impact on the LNG contracts and that is from consumer sites. Japan or other importers are not going to feel comfortable signing a 20 years contract uh, with Qatar, having in mind that another Qatar crisis could go more intense and that could uh, endanger their supply. So the consumers are going to push for more flexible uh, terms and also um, other um, again going back to those uh, huge volumes of uh, contracts for LNG that are expiring Japan is going to consider reconsider uh, to diversify some of these uh, contracts from uh, Qatar to other suppliers and possibly US and um, just the bottom side uh, discuss further about the role of US uh, in the LNG market I'm going to um, stop here and looking forward to your questions